But let's pray. We're going to get right into it. We've got a lot to cover to wrap up this book. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, as we get into your word this morning, Lord, I ask for the precious Spirit's guidance, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit to give me utterance, that I may speak what you want me to speak. There's so much to share, so help me to speak those things that you want them to know. And Lord, give me wisdom, give me guidance in the direction where to go as we teach, but also give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying through your word. And we just look to you and trust in you to teach us this morning through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So, go to Revelation, chapter, last two chapters, chapter 21 and chapter 22. We're going to cover the last two chapters, and then we're done with the book of, with the, with the book of Revelation, and we're done with the Bible. We can go home now. That's cute. Because <laughs> this is the end of the story right here, man. This is the end of the, of the story, and praise God. Help me know. We know. I, I've read the end of the book, so I know how it's going to turn out. Yeah. Right? So no matter what you're going through, how you feel, we're at the end of the book. So before I get into uh, talking about Revelation 21 and 22, I kind of want to lay the background of what we're going to get into, okay? Because last week, you know, we, we were in chapter 20. And remember, we talked about Satan after, after the seven-year tribulation. Jesus shows up on Mount of Olives. He takes over as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We enter in the millennium, which is a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And, and we're reigning with him, right? But then what happens at, after the thousand years is over, because the, the, the enemy is locked in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years, it said. And, and when the thousand years is over, he gets released for a while. Remember, I explained that. Why? Because there's going to be people that are going to be born during the millennium, and they also have to choose. They have a choice. Are you still going to serve Jesus after having a thousand years of peace, or, or you still don't want him to be your Lord? And that's where the enemy comes with people. It's hard to believe, but there's people that grow up in the tribulation that are still not going to want to have Jesus as their Lord. They're going to gather, to, the enemy's going to gather them, and they're going to come against the, the holy city, and then fire comes from heaven and devours them. And, uh, and then we got into talking about the great white throne at the end of the tribulation. Where everybody who is not saved will appear before God. We appear as believers before the judgment seat of Christ to either gain or lose rewards. But they appear, the unbeliever, before the great white throne judgment to what? To be judged by their works. It's going to be a fair thing because God's going to look at their works. And of course we know they're not going to make it. But then he, he has the book of life, just to double check, make sure their name is not written in there. Showing them that if you had believed in Jesus, you could have made it by being in the book of life. So are you standing on his work or your work? I don't know about you, I'm not standing on my works, I'm standing on Jesus' finished work. So, so here's the thing though, I want, before I get into 21 and 22, because there's two ways that you can see what we're going to talk about, and I think it's important. And I think this might be new to some of you because I've, I had not heard this before in my early teachings of, of learning from Revelation. So before we start 21 and 22, I, I want to mention there's one scholar that brought this out and I thought it was very, very interesting. And you can, there's, it's not an issue of doctrine, but what's going to happen in, in 21, 22? Because he was, he was bringing a couple of things out that I thought was very interesting. When it talks about a new heavens and a new earth, he says he believes it's actually referring back to the millennium. Because I've always believed it's always a new heavens, a new earth. That's after the thousand years. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, blah, 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 right? That's the way I've always believed. But he brought some interesting things out. And he has some good points that it possibly could be this way. So I wanted to bring both sides. Only God knows, right? But there are some scriptural things that he points out. In other words, what am I saying? It's almost like John... He went ahead of time past the millennium, like to the end of millennium, to talk about what happens to the devil and to people that don't believe. Right? But then when you start reading 21 and 22, you start hearing about a river. 22 talks about there's going to be a river with leaves, uh, the trees that's for the healing of the nations. That sounds millennial. Because in the millennium, there's going to be a, a Jerusalem temple. And there is going to be, like I told you before, a river that's going to flow from the temple. And it, there is going to be trees that, that has healing for the nations. We don't need to get healed. We're in our glorified bodies. So it's almost like John backtracked after he was kind of laying the case. Here's what's going to happen to the devil. Here's what's going to happen to the unbelievers. 
but then he backs track to 21, and this is now what's going to happen during the millennium. Now, if it is either way, it doesn't change what we believe. It's going to be good either way, right? So if it's after the millennium that we see the holy city, great. If it's during the millennium, even greater. So it's not an issue that, but I wanted to bring both sides because it's very interesting and help us understand some of the scripture. In fact, if you read Ezekiel, you can write that down, but you'll see it in your notes. If you read Ezekiel 47, 1 to 12, it talks, remember, we sing that song about a river going deep into the river, take me to the waters, and that's what it's referring to, Ezekiel going to the, you go deeper, deeper. Well, Ezekiel talks about this river with trees and, and so forth, and it's he healing for the nations. That's Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. But if you read uh, Revelation 22, 1 through 5, it says the same thing about this river with trees on each side and it's for the heat and it bears fruit every month well that if it bears fruit every month that's time in eternity there is no time so that's why that might be a clue he is talking about the millennium uh, that he, that's referring to the millennium so, so there's some clues there that could be that it's referring to the millennium or eternity after the thousand years either way though it's going to be good. In fact, can you do me a favor? Go to Isaiah 65, 7 through 19. This is the millennial scripture that's actually, Revelation in my notes pushes back to Isaiah. Revelation 22. Uh, look at this. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So here it talks about, be, be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. Well, Jerusalem, there's going to be the, the city of Jerusalem and the new, uh, a new temple there. But there's also going to be, what, the new Jerusalem. And that's different. So, but notice that last verse we read. I'm going to create new heavens and a new, what, earth. So Revelation 22 goes back to that. So here's, so again, it's not nothing that whether you believe one way or the other, it's not going to change anything, but it's, it's interesting of what my, we might be seeing. Because remember I told you, scientists are saying that the earth is going back to what it used to be. Slowly it is moving back to the axis it used to be. The axis is off center. And that's, and I believe people live long on the earth. They say in Noah's time, that's why there was giants in the land. There was also people that lived long lives. And why? Because your body, uh, they, they've seen people with bigger hearts, bigger everything that have been found. Again, it was a different world where the oxygen was richer. Your body would just re revitalize itself every seven years. And you lived a long time healthy life and that's why you see the longest guy that lived was a thousand was 969 Methuselah and the reason he lived a long time I think is the mercy of God because Enoch says when you have your son the flood will come at before he, you know when he dies the flood will come well guess how long he lived 969 years that's the mercy and the grace of God when Enoch died that year the flood came I mean when not Enoch Methuselah his son Amen? So, here we go. Are you ready? So notice, notice in ver chapter 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven. Notice, a, notice it doesn't say heavens. A new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was, sorry honey, no more sea. I read that. I'm sad. I'm so sad. But no, don't, don't be sad because there are, that, that doesn't mean there's still going to be water. There's rivers and there's, and there's lakes. She says she needs, well, God, you're going to have to deal with her, so you're going to have to. <laughs> My wife is sad because there's no ocean. But don't, you're not going to be complaining when you see it, though, right? Because you're going to have your own personal ocean in your mansion. You're going to have the, the back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so notice, though, notice that it said heaven, a new heaven, and a new earth. Now, we know biblically there, are, when it talks about heaven here, it's not saying necessarily the whole universe. It's talking about heaven and earth. So what do you mean? The atmosphere. Biblically, there's three, there's three heavens. The first heaven is what you see around the earth atmosphere. Right? That's what the earth, where you see, you know what I'm saying? The earth at, at atmosphere. What's the second heaven? Second heaven is where the stars are, space. The final frontier, no, you know what they say? Space, that's the second heaven. Guess what the third heaven, Paul says, I went to the third heaven, Paul said. I went to the third heaven. Yeah. 
What's the third heaven? That's where God himself dwells. That's where the temple is. Amen. That's where we go to be with the Lord when we die. Right? So that's the third heaven. So there's three heavens. The first heaven. So what is God saying? New heaven, new earth. I believe what's happening. Again, the earth is going to tilt back. God's going to redo things. It's like replenish and redo things. And there's going to be a new atmosphere, new heaven, and a new earth. Okay? So we see that. Right? A new heaven and a new earth. Remember Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. Right? Now again, it says there's going to be no more sea, honey, but it does, doesn't mean there's not going to be rivers, there's going to be lakes, there's going to be other things that I think are going to be even better than you can imagine. So be happy. Verse, verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city. Check it out. I, John, saw the holy city. New Jer now notice, there's a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, if John backtracked to, to the millennium, then this would be during the millennium. If it's after the millennium, either way, it's cool and it's awesome. Anyway, right? So, listen. So notice what it says. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, some scholars will say, you see, the church is not the bride. The church is the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. We're the body, which is true. The church cannot be the bride. The bride is the holy city. But the Bible says it comes as a bride, the holy city. It's adorned as a bride. doesn't mean, why? How could a thing be a bride? It has to be what occupies that building, which will be, or that city, which will be us, God and us. And we're, the church that's in there is the bride. Amen? So, so you see what I'm saying? So, so this new Jerusalem is the holy city coming down from heaven, and, 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 but yet... I believe really the bride is us in, the, in, that, in that place, right? In this holy city. Amen? Now, just to give you a picture, well, let, let's read a little bit first. Verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Come on now. God himself will be with them, and what? Be their God. Now check this out. Can you put, put, put those images? I'm going to show you a picture of how big. I, I'm kind of going ahead. Later on we'll read how big it is. But let me just give it to you right now. It's 1,500 miles long. 1,000. And here's a, here's a great picture so you can see it. Here's uh, Florida over here. Here's Arizona over here. And I, and I know because of the thing it doesn't look as square. But it's actually a square. It's 1,500 miles long. A thousand five miles, hundred miles the other way, and a thousand five hundred miles high. That's how big the city is. From here, from Arizona, it'd be like going to Kansas City or further from Phoenix and so forth. That's how big this city is. Have you, have we ever seen any city that big? Never, never. Here, let me go to the next image to show you a picture of how how how, how beautiful it might be. Again, but you you're looking at this, but it's a thousand five hundred miles, you know, long. It, you can't compare. Now, put the other image that shows the, of the earth. I think it's the next one. That's, that's how it would look. If you, if you were to do the measurement or whatever, there's the earth, there's the United States, and there's that big chunk of cheese right there. <laughs> that's how big it is. Now, see, our minds, it, it's massive. It's huge. So, I believe, in fact, one guy did some figures of how many people he believes will be saved and whatever. And he says, there's enough, because what did Jesus say? I go to prepare up, John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back to receive you to myself. Amen. Come on, young men. Young, young man, if you plan on getting married, first of all, number one, get a job. <laughs> Work and get a job. And I would recommend that you get a place. You get a, you know what I'm saying? Build a house, get a house or whatever. And why? That's what Jesus did. He's been building our place for 2,000 years. And when he's done, come on now, and he's a, he's a good construction. Hey, come on, Jesus is the builder, amen? So he's, he, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, guess what? This guy did some figures. He said, there's enough room in there that probably like you would get like at least every person in their mansion would be with space would be like 75 acres. Wow. So, so uh, John, don't worry about it. You'll have your ranch with your horses and right? 75 acres. Amen. 
And who knows, it could be even more when, when you figure it out and so forth. But that's with counting the billions of people that have been lived and whatever. He, he did some estimates. And that's how, I'm just trying to show you how big this thing is. It's humongous. Is there another picture or was that it? Okay, that's fine. Okay, but see how, how big it is? And how awesome and beautiful it is? But, but let's go on though. Let's keep reading. Look at this. Verse 4. But verse 3, what's the point? God's with us. God is going to live with us in that city. God is going to dwell with us. We're going to see Him face to face. Woo, glory to God. Amen. Heaven is coming down to us. Amen. Heaven is coming down to us. Now, and here's, here's the benefits, verse 4, of living in this holy city. Here's the benefits of it. Verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen? Remember that song, Take a good look at my face. See the, right? You'll see the what? The track of my tear. God's going to remove that track. Get rid of the, 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 yeah, right? The eye problems, the issues, the, you know, the rios. Because you're going to be young and beautiful. Amen? Forever 21. Forever 30. You're going to have to start a new outlet. Forever 30. <laughs> so notice, here's the benefits of in that holy city. God is going to wipe. See, people, that's why I'm saying no matter what you're facing right now, no matter what you're going through, it's temporary. Even through that, what, what, what caused Paul to be able to put up with all the stuff he was putting up, being whipped and, and, and you know, hit and, and thrown in jail and, and being persecuted? Why? He had a godly perspective. He had an eternal perspective. Why? Because notice, he's going to wipe away every tear from how? Why is that? Because there's going to be no more death there. Come on now. No more dying. No more death. What else? No more sorrow. No more sorrow. This is God's perfect will. You want to know, Pastor, what's God's perfect will? This is His perfect will because this is what He has planned for us. Listen, what else? No more crying over you. No more crying. No more crying. See, and I know, I know here in this world or whatever, you know, people talk about, hey man, you just gotta, you gotta endure. You just gotta, you gotta deal with the pain. No pain, no gain. No, no pain, no gain. No pain. I don't know about you, but I don't like that. I'm, I want God's, God's plan is, hey, there's gonna be a place of no more pain. Amen. Amen. No more pain. For the former things have what? Woo! I don't know about you, but I'm happy that coming soon is a day when there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death. I get to see my loved one in the Lord. I get to see him forever. I get to, and with their healthy body, a glorified body. Oh, man. Mm. In fact, I believe God's got a special body for those that had issues here today. So don't get jealous if your loved one looks better than you. Come on now. Yeah, because I'm telling you, he's going to make it up for that person that had issues in this world, that was going through all the pain and all the hurt. When they get their glorified body and how beautiful they look, they're going to be rejoicing. You're going to be rejoicing and thanking God. You're such a good God. This is temporary. Mm. Now, I didn't plan on saying that, but I believe that, I believe that was the Spirit of God. There's a special body that God has for those that were mocked and ridiculed because either they had a physical infirmity in this world and whatever and, and they were ridiculed and mocked or whatever I believe God's going to give them the best bodies they're going to look the best as long as I don't look like a donkey pastor right amen in fact, Isaiah 25, 8, that refers to, this is a good scripture about verse 4, if you want to put Isaiah 25, 8 for me. He will swallow up death forever. See, that, that's God's will. 
The God's going to swallow up what? Death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. See, that's going to be fulfilled. Now let's go back to Revelation 21, verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are what? True and faithful. If God says he's making all things new, he's making all... Now, here's a difference though when God makes it new this time. We live in the law of time where things what? Age? You know, the law... What is that? Entropy? What is that? Those of you who are good in science, where things always get you know, bad. In other words, they start winding down. That's why we age. Because you know, it, it reaches a certain peak and it starts getting lower and lower. They say the universe too is expanding and slowing, you know, slowing down than from where it first started. So entropy or whatever they call it, where things decay in other words. So when God makes something new, it doesn't mean you're going to get older, you're going to get decay. No, it's going to be always constant stays new stays new forever we will be in our glorified bodies never get old again stay new stay new well pastor I remember the goal I want to remember the goal no you don't want to remember the golden years <laughs> those were the days no you don't want to remember that <laughs> girls were girls and men were men those were the days those were the days what happened amen so notice he says right for these words are what true and what is he saying it's going to happen God's word is true and he's faithful he's going to make it happen look at verse 6 and, and he said to me it is done I am what the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end and I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts now this is amazing here notice to anyone who is thirsty they can come and drink freely from the fountain of the water of life we know that's our Lord Jesus Christ do you know what faith is simply explained here drinking you receive from God by drinking amen come and drink he says no it doesn't say come when you're worthy it didn't say come when you got it all together. No, just come and drink. Wherever you are, whatever position in life you are, just drink. That drinking equals faith. Amen. You just got to, are you thirsty? Yeah. Do you feel lost? Yeah. Then come and drink. That's all you got to do. Drink. Amen. Amen. It's done. It's done. If anyone th is thirsty, come and you know, notice it is done. And then look at verse 7. Verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Well, how do we overcome? First John chapter 5 says that we have already overcome by our what? By our faith in Jesus. We who have believed in Jesus are already world overcomers. Amen? Amen? We're overcomers because we put our faith in Jesus. Yeah. Amen? Look at verse 8. But, now this is important, the cowardly, Wow, have you ever thought that? I thought people that, you know, end up not being saved. Notice the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters. Sorcerer deals with drugs, right? Sorcerer, you know, idolaters and all liars. Hijuela, liars! <laughs> the mentirosos make it too. All lawyers go to Washington, D.C. No, just kidding. <laughs> not funny, not funny. That was not funny. But the cowardly, yeah, Lord help us. Unbelieving, the abominable murders. Listen, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is what? The second, remember we talked about what is the second death? The lake of fire. Can you go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11? See, now you understand 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. What is he referring to? Don't you know that the unrighteous, those that are not saved, that's who he's referring to, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, 
nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's explaining the fruit of people who are not saved. Now, can Christians commit these things? Big Y-E-S. But these people are practicing it as a lifestyle. That's their life, so that's what they live. In other words, there's, you see what I'm saying? As a Christian, can you do these things? Because he's talking to Christians here. Look at the next verse. And such were some of you. So he's talking to Christians that are, that, and so in other words, some of these Christians are committing these things. And he, so what does he do? He reminds them, hey, wait a minute. That's what you used to do. Amen? Such were some of you, but you were what? You were washed. Come on now. You were what? You were sanct You were set apart. But you were what? Justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See, you were. So when somebody tells me, well, I can't help it. I'm this way and I can't help it. I can't change. No, no, no. You just don't know who you are. Especially if it's a Christian. They don't know who they are. They don't know what Jesus did for them. Amen? So, so can Christians commit these things? Of course they can. Can they live in a style like, and so forth? They might go astray and live for a time this way. But if they're truly saved, eventually they will come back. Because talk to them. When you talk to them, they're miserable inside. They might act like everything's okay here, but on the inside they're miserable. They know it. You know it. Amen. And so let's go back now. Let's go back to verse, uh, verse 8. Now, here's the way to put it. If you're born once, you die twice. In other words, if you're bo born once physically, you'll end up in the lake of fire, the second death. But if you're born twice, both physically and what? Spiritually born again, then you only die once physically. Or, if you're here when Jesus shows up, you actually never die. We are the generation that a lot of us here, I believe, are not going to see death at all. We will not die physically because we're going to be when the rap here when the rapture happens. So in other words, born once, you die physically without the Lord, you end up in the second death, in the lake of fire. Born twice, mean being born physically with your mom, and then born again, and you only die once. Or you may not die if the rapture happens when you're alive. Isn't that good news? Yeah. So you got to be born what? Again. To avoid the lake of fire. Now, let's go back. Uh, 20, verse 9. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last place, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the what? Holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So notice, New Jerusalem descending what? Out of heaven from God. Listen, having, verse 11, Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Verse 12, and she also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Right? Verse 13. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city, verse 14, had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Verse 15. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. Twelve thousand furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. That's where now some translations might say it's like a thousand three hundred and eighty. But others say, no, it's 1,500, amen, of, of, of the height. 1,500 wide, high, and long, amen. The city wall, you could say, is 216 feet tall. Just the wall, 216 feet tall, or like a 22-foot st uh, story building, amen. Now, where was I? Verse uh, 18, 17, oh yeah. Then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, and, 
that is of an angel, so that one is 216 feet. The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was what? Pure, Pure gold. But notice, not just the gold like you see a yellow. It's clear, almost like clear glass. Ladies, you're, if you like jewelry and stuff, you're going to be blown away. Amen? You're going to be like walking into a jewelry. The jewelry that you see, you're going to walk into it. It'll be so awesome. Amen? And then verse 19. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. Man, think about it. Jesus is an amazing builder. You know, when we build buildings here, we think we, we're so awesome as men. We built Rome, was built and all this stuff. Oh, think of all these fancy buildings, nice, beautiful buildings that have been built. These towering, like the, the one tower in New York. And, and all these beautiful buildings that man has built. You know what? <laughs> it's like Jesus saying, oh yeah, that was nice what you guys built. Let me show you the building that I built. And we're like, the, the. perdón, perdón, perdón. <laughs> Listen, verse 19, uh, uh, precious stones, the first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. And the tenth, chrysoprase. And the eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. I think that was the one you like, honey. It's purple. Verse 21. The twelve gates were twelve what? Pearl. The gate itself was made of a per one pearl. Man. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent grass. Here we have blacktop. <laughs> Over dirt. Here everything, everything is pure gold like transparent. You know, Pastor, you might say, why would it be like that? Why, why it needs to be transparent? You know why? You're going to find out in just a little bit. I'll tell you why. But not now. <laughs> right? Let's keep reading. Verse, verse 22. In fact, it, can, I, can I show you something before we go to the 22? Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10. Oh, this is so good. See, it puts all these scriptures together. Now you understand Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith what? Remember this? By faith Abraham. He obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as what? An inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Sometimes do you feel that way? I don't know where I'm going. But I'm looking for a city. <laughs> By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. Dwelling what? Now people, think about Abraham. The, our father of faith. Abraham didn't even live in a nice regular house. He was camping all the time. He lived in tents all his time. But what does that show? Abraham is a picture of us. We're, he's the father of the faith. We're, we're pilgrims in this land. We're just walking through. We're here temporary. This is not our permanent place in this world. God has a holy city that he's building for us. Ooh, I'm starting to get excited. Listen. He dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. But check this out. Look at verse 10. For he what? He waited for the city which has what? Foundations whose builder and maker is God. Mm. I don't know about you. Listen, I thank God for my house. You know, I, I built it back then for my honey. That's what I'm trying to tell you. When you get married, you got to build a house for your honey. I built that house for my honey, amen, and, 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 and so forth. And hey, during that time back in the 92, amen, it was a pretty nice house downtown hood in El Mirage, Arizona, because it was in 92. There was many houses going up, amen? And so it was like you know, a two-story house in the, in the hood. Come on now, this guy must be rich or something. No, I'm not rich. And, well, yeah, I'm rich, but you know what I'm saying. But, you know, and it was nice. And I remember when we moved, it was like, wow, this, are we in the new, like you were, you know, in a, in a resort or something. And, and so forth. And it's nice and beautiful, but you know what? It's nothing. I'm looking for a new, that place. That's where I want to dwell. Amen? God is not El Chipo. Amen? He's El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. He's going to, we think, so listen, when you see a believer that's blessed and driving a fancy car, listen, that ain't nothing, man. Jesus, what Jesus has for us is so much greater. 
Amen? GQ, whatever, you, whatever it is that you're into, it's going to be nothing. Amen? Eh? MK, Gucci, EM for El Mirage. Amen? <laughs> Let's go on. Verse 22. It's going to be amazing. I don't know about you, but now I understand. Now I understand what, how Abraham could put up in living in tents. Because you know what? I'm waiting for something much better than this. This is just temporary. Amen. You might be wor working in the mud. You might, just like that one story I've heard of a, 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 this, uh, this person that was working in the mud in the fields and whatever, and they started shouting, Hallelujah, glory. And I said, what's wrong with you? Oh, I just got to thinking about the streets of gold that I'm going to be walking on. This is temporary. Amen. Verse 22. But I saw no temple in it. In the, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. See, in this holy city, there's no need for a temple. The city had no need of sun. Here's, here's why, the transparency. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. Amen. The Lamb is its light. The reason it's going to be trans like crystal clear, why? Because the light of God is going to just flow through the whole city. There, we're, not going to, we're not going to need the sun anymore. It's a new heaven, new earth. We're not going to need the sun anymore. In fact, here's what's amazing. The holy city is going to be what's going to light the world. Well, think about that big block of cheese like that. Right? Look, it looks like a big block of cheese in North America. It's, 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 it's almost like, you know what I'm saying? So who needs the moon and whatever else? The illumination of the glory of God in that temple, in, I mean in the holy city, is going to be so amazing. There, that's what's going to light up the whole world. Amen. That's how bright. That's how much glory is going to be coming out of God and out of you. Because you're going to be in His glory and in His presence. Oh, can you imagine? That's why people that die and, and see a bit of heaven and come back, they're like, man, why did you resusc resuscitate me? Let, leave me alone. <laughs> you don't know what I see. Are you kidding me? Amen? And so, and so where was I? Verse, um, verse 24. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. See, there's a, a cue that that's why that other guy thinks this is during the millennium. The nations of those that are saved, that make it through the tribulation, are walking in its light. Notice, the, the city is lighting up the whole world. Amen? <laughs> and listen, and the kings of the earth, notice kings of the earth, bring what? Their honor into it. So, what? That shows like there's people living on the earth. So it could be the millennium. Verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the... Notice, they're going to bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So it almost sounds millennial in a way. Amen? Verse 27. And there shall be no... But notice, and there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are what? Written in the Lamb's book of life. What's the point here? Of course, nobody that's not saved would ever be able to make it because they're not going to be there anyway. Right? Right? And, and so forth. So, so notice, now, but if, it, if it's referring to the millennium, there are going to be people that have to make a choice. So they can't go in there. Only those that are saved with glorified bodies will be able to enter the holy city. Isn't that good? Yes. Amen. So now, chapter 22. Let's finish this thing up. Chapter 22. And then he showed me a, a pure river of water of life. Again, this is where, again, it sounds millennial here. Clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Well, wait a minute. We just said there wasn't, we just read there was no throne in the holy city. But here it says there's a throne. So is that the new Jerusalem? It could be referring to the new Jerusalem. Ezekiel's temple. That's Ezekiel 39. I mean 40, 41 to 42. If you read that, it could be referring to Ezekiel's millennial temple. Listen, let's keep reading. Proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. In the middle of its street, listen. And on the other side of the street was what? The tree of life. Which bore what? Twelve fruits. Each tree yielding its fruit every what? That's time. Every month. 
The leaves of the tree were for, for what? For the healing of the nations. So it does sound like almost Ezekiel, if you read Ezekiel 47, it talks about the trees and the healing of the... So it could be. Amen. Now, let's keep reading verse 3. And there shall be no more what? Come on now. No more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve. Them. Notice there it says servants. We're not servants. I mean, yes, we serve the Lord, but we're, we're His bride. We're the body of Christ. So there's people that are going to be serving in the temple there. In the, and so forth. Now, let's keep reading. Look at verse 4 though. Isn't that awesome? They shall see what? Come on now. You're going to see the Lord Jesus' face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. Look at verse 5. There shall be no night there. Those of you that love the nightlife, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pastor, I love the nightlife and I like the boogie. No more. There should be no nightlife there. I mean, that's not what I said, but... There should, they need no lamp nor light of the sun. Why? For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Woo, glory to God. Are you seeing that? They shall what? Reign forever. For, so, so who's dwelling? So there's the nations that are saved and so forth, and then, and then we, though, that are in our glorified bodies, we're... You know, we're going to be with the Lord in the, in the holy city. Amen? Now, where was I? Verse uh, 6? Okay. Now notice verse 6. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Right? So this is starting to end the prophecy. Look at verse 7. Here's Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming what? Quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Right? So, notice the time is near. And here's verse 7 ends this prophecy that Jesus gave. With verse 7, the prophecy that began in Revelation 4 has now ended. Amen? So what did Jesus say? Hey, I'm coming soon. Amen. He's coming, he's coming quickly. It's going to happen suddenly, people. When it starts, it's going to move quickly. Yeah. Amen. It's going to move quickly. Let's keep reading. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Notice, John just got overtaken by what he saw. And he falls and starts worshiping the angel. Verse 9, then he said to me, see that you don't do that. This is the second time he's done that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. See, no angel should be worshipped. Only God. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. For the why? The time is at hand. Revelation is not supposed to be sealed up. And the closer we get, the clearer it's becoming. Remember Daniel says, God told Daniel, seal the book until the time of the end. Revelation is not sealed up. Verse, verse 10, 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy. Why would he say that? To say, tell somebody, if they're filthy, let them stay filthy. The point is this. It's getting so close that it's time that you need to make a decision. It's that close that, hey, it, you're getting to that point where we're coming to the end of the funnel and we're going to go into a time of millennial reign and things are going to change. And then it's, you know what I'm saying? So you need to make your choice for Jesus Christ and accept the Lord before it's too late. That's, what it's, that, that's why it's given that warning. Amen? Now, verse 12. Hear Jesus speaking again. All of a sudden here, he's testifying to the churches. And behold, I am coming what? Quickly. And what? My reward is with me to give to everyone according to work. So notice, he's not coming to, to judge you for your bad things. He's coming to give you what? A reward for the things you did. Now you could lose them if you don't know how you do them, but the fire will be used, but it, fire purifies. It'll just leave the good stuff. And you'll get a reward for those things. Amen? So Jesus is coming to what? To give you a reward. 
Amen? It's, it's the judgment seat of, seat of Christ. And then, and then notice verse 13. I am the Alpha, he says, and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. Now understand, people, who is coming. It's Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega. In fact, if you were to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Check it out in the interlinear Bible. In the interlinear Bible, it says, in the beginning, in Hebrew, the Aleph and the Taf created the heavens and the earth. What's that in Greek? The Alpha and Omega. So hidden in the first verse of the Bible is who is the one who created it. In the beginning, the Alpha and Omega created the heavens and the earth. Here we're at the end of the book. And what does Jesus say? I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. Amen. In fact, Zechariah chapter 12, uh, 10 says, this, uh, I think it's, yeah, chapter 12 verse 10 says, they will look upon me when Jesus shows up at the end of the tribulation and it says, they're going to look upon me whom they pierced. If you read it in the interlinear Bible, guess what it says? Same thing. It, the, the Jews left it out in the translation. They did not put that in the translation because they, they didn't like touching the name of God. It was too holy, too pure. They wouldn't touch it. So when you read Zechariah 12.10, it reads this way. Literally, in the, in, the, in the Hebrew, it reads this way. It says, they will look upon me, the Aleph and the Tav, the one they pierced. Or you could say in Greek, they will look upon me, the Alpha and Omega, the one that they have pierced. Amen. And then they're going to repent. And, and God says, I'm going to pour the Spirit of grace on them. Amen? Isn't that amazing? So who's coming? It's the Alpha and the Omega. It's Jesus Christ, the Creator, the one who made you is coming back for you. Amen? The Alpha and the first and the last. Let's keep reading verse 14. For blessed are those who do His commandments, and they may, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, here's something interesting. Did you notice there's a little footnote there on verse 14? Blessed are those who do His commandments. You know how that can be interpreted too, verse 14? In my Bible right here it says, who wash their robes. So, being obedient to the faith. Wash their robes in the Lamb's blood. Blessed are those who have their robes washed. Whoo! In the Lamb's robes. Amen? Their robes washed in the Lamb's blood. Amen? So, so notice verse 15, because we know our, that our, 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 what we're to do is have faith, drink, and receive. Amen? Let's wrap this up. But notice, verse 15, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. See, it's not that a Christian that lies once, it's the ones that it's a continual, it's a practicing. Are they really saved or not? Habitual liars. So you see that? Do you see? So he's trying to show that those people will not make it into the city, a holy city. Amen. And so forth. Now let's notice the next verse. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Listen, the enemy is a liar and the father of it. And that's when you get the word Lucifer, it means, it means light and so forth. But the enemy is a deceiver. Did you know, I know of one minister who was caught up before he got saved into New Age. And what's happening in New Age, see, it started... The enemy knows the time is near. He brought in evolution in the 1850s to prepare people to receive his great lie of what? Aliens are going to come and take people away. In fact, you know what? People that have, people that have seen aliens and whatever, you know, UFO, whatever, they say that these, these beings say this. They say that you need to, you, you need to follow Lucifer. You need to, uh, we need to, you know, come together as one for this new world. This is, this is what these aliens are telling these people that see them. Well, guess what those aliens are? They're demons. 
And so it started in 1850 with the lie of evolution. Why? That, you know, we all evolved, you know, like I like the way he says, you know, from, from the goo to the zoo to you. That's how it happened. From the goo to the zoo to you. No, it didn't happen that way. Amen? Even though I know you have some cousins that look like monkeys. But, so, ouch. <laughs> so, 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 so it was a deception. So the lie, when the rapture happens, you know what the lie, these people are going to say? Oh, that was all part. You guys are the chosen ones. These others are misfits. They didn't want to receive other people that are different. The, you, you guys are... Uh, you guys are the are uh, we're going to lead into come into a new world over and we're going to overcome this this whatever this god that is trying to keep us from living our own free lives and be united in unity that's the lie that's going to be so so listen so when the rapture happens it's going to be explained away oh yeah aliens or whatever or somebody you know we've evolved it's part of evolution the bad people were removed and we're the good ones and you need to follow Lucifer. He's going to bring us to the new world. Didn't God say they're going to receive a lie? There's, there's going to be strong delusion. They'll be deceived. I'm telling you people, this world is already prepared for it. It's already prepared for it. Listen, verse 17. But notice, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say what? Come. And let him who thirsts, come. Come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life. I love the what he's saying. Look, we're, the, we're, we're part of the bride. We're part of the holy city and so forth. And it's like they're saying, come. I don't know about you. I want Jesus to come. One person wants Jesus to come. The rest, they were just one. Just one. Masuna. One is the loneliest number. So it's just one person. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Notice. Come. The, the, the holy city is ready to receive us. The, the church is ready. And, and, and I'm, no, come. Notice what. Go to Isaiah 50. Uh, this, this is Isaiah 55. One. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and wear wages for what doesn't satisfy? The things of the world don't satisfy us. Why are we wasting all our money in the things of the world? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Come on, man. So that's what the Spirit of God is saying here. Come, come. And he who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, if you're thirsty, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Verse 18. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone, verse 19, takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So you know what? When I, you know, some pastors won't even touch the book of Revelation because they're afraid that they might say something wrong or whatever and so forth. Now, listen, he's not talking about that, that you're reading through the book and you're mis you know, misinterpreting something or mistranslating what you're reading. Again, that's why I gave you two sides to what might happen in the millennium. I don't know. I just go in by what I'm reading. Unless God makes it more clear, he'll show me. So I'm not trying to make new stuff up. See what I'm saying? I'm not trying to add to it. What he's referring to, and I like what, uh, what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Jack Kelly says, in spite of this clear warning, there have been many attempts to, listen, here's the issue. When you try to, oh, that's just symbolism. That's, this is not going to happen. This is just an allegory. And there's people that believe that we're, we've already been through the revelation. There's where you're, you're, you're making the book to be something that is not. You're saying that this is not real. That's not going to happen. Hey, we're already living in re tribulation and revelation right now. Uh -uh, I would, I would, to you, you're in danger ground. Because you're, you're not taking God at his word. You're, you're, you're taking away from what it's true meaning. So he says, there have been many attempts to allegorize or spiritualize this book into something that it was never intended to be. It's neither history nor allegory nor fantasy, but it's what? Bible prophecy. And it will be fulfilled just as God has promised, all, regardless of all the efforts at denial notwithstanding. 
It's going to happen. This is Bible. You know, a third of the Bible is Bible prophecy. Amen. And it's going to happen. So see, he's not talking about you if you read it, if you misinterpret it. Oh, God's going to put a plague on it. That's not, come on. It's people that don't believe in it and are using it to, to do their own thing. Oh yeah, there's no, there's no lake of fire. There, it's just as allegory. Symbolism. First of all, you need to find out if you're saved. Because if you don't believe in, and that's what Jesus says, if you don't believe this book, right? Finally, and then I'm going to show you something before we end here. Look at verse 20 though. He who testifies to these things says, surely, this is Jesus, in letter, letters in red, you know, red, surely Jesus says, what? I am coming, what? Amen. Quickly. And notice, amen, John says, even so, come Lord Jesus. So those of you that, that tell me and say, oh pastor, you need a way, you need a way. No, 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 no. I agree with John and I agree with Jesus. Jesus, I'm, I'm coming quickly and John says, amen, so come Lord Jesus. Jesus. Come on now. And notice the last verse in the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be what? Be with you. I like what Enduring Word Commentary says this. Isn't that interesting? You know, how, how does the Old Testament end? In the last verse of the Old Testament, it contains a curse. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse, Malachi 4, 6. Fittingly, the last words of the New Testament speak of what? Grace. Because grace describes God's dealing with man on the basis of the New Covenant. And then real quick, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Real quick, let me show you something here. And then I'm going to show you a video before we end. Now, you can understand 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1. Well, actually, go down to... Let's see. Go down to a little bit more to... I'm not sorry, not First Peter, Second Peter. I'm sorry, it's me. I, I, I did a boo-boo. Go to Second Peter chapter, chapter 3. Second Peter, I messed up. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle to which to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Verse 2. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles and the Lord and Savior. Verse 3. Knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. Verse 4, saying, ah, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Verse 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Verse 6, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for what? fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Verse 8. But beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should... That's why Jesus hasn't come yet. But time is running out. Next verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away and with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Now you've got to understand when Peter wrote this, John hadn't gotten revelation yet. So John gives more information about heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct? And See, what I've been teaching you should cause you to want, motivate you to want to live for God looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for what new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells therefore beloved looking forward to anybody looking forward to these things Amen. be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless blameless doesn't mean you're perfect but you're, you're you know, pursuing the Lord. You're going forward with Him. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, even Peter admits about Paul's writings, speaking in them of these things about the end times, some are things are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the, also what? The rest of the scriptures. There's people that tear up the scriptures, man. 
because they don't read it all together and, and balance it all together. You therefore, beloved, since you know these, this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away from the air of the wicked. But what should you do? Oh, back to grace. See, we are an end time church. I do believe God told me to call this church for a reason because we're an end time church and the mission he told me grow in grace. Why? Because we're an end time church and we're right in the Bible. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever. The last words in the Bible. What? May the Lord, may the grace of the Lord be with you and also with you. Listen. Now, stay on. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Uh, I want to show you. I want the lights off, and I want you to look, look at this now. Now, this this is a guy's interpretation. He's showing that the, the city being in eternity, okay? But I just want you to see a picture of what it might at the end of the millennium, and then eternity, or if it is in the millennium. Either way, I just want you to get, you know a, a picture is worth a thousand. You know they, they say. I want you to see this. So go ahead and turn that on and lower the front light. Can you make me some room there, honey? Mm -hmm. this way. And put okay. the volume up too. Okay. Yeah. yeah, volume. That's when the enemy is put in the pit. And then he's released. That could be referring to the New Jerusalem Temple during the thousand years in Israel. That's how it looks in Ezekiel, so they're trying to draw it out how Ezekiel saw it. Now this is not the holy city, this is the temple of Jerusalem, millennial temple. Great white throne judgment.
Now these are unbelievers. These are not the saved here. These are unbelievers. It doesn't do it justice how big it looks. <laughs> Well, Pastor, I feel like I just went to the movies. You didn't have to go to the movies today. Amen. Now, how can you explain something you don't see yet? That's spiritual, you know, that's in the spirit. So it, we can only just paint pictures, but it's going to be way, way greater than that. In fact, that city, and there's no compare. I, I believe it's that tall because there's going to be different room all the way up those, you know, it's going to be humongous. It's just going to be amazing. 
amazing. But at the same time, you know, it motivates me. That's why I preach what I preach. That's why I talk about what I talk about. That's why we do what we do. My heart, you know, I want pe more people to come yeah. to this beautiful city to know yeah. Jesus. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I don't want to see any, I want them to know the love of Jesus. And it's free. It's for anybody, it's for anybody who wants it. Yeah. Amen. So, so let's end in prayer. And, 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 and if you're watching me, you know, you saw that, you need Jesus, man, I want to I wanna lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus if you're ready. You just got to come and drink and receive his life. So let me pray over you. Father, I pray right now for everyone in the sound of my voice, those that are watching, those that are here. And I pray, Father, that they'll not be the same this day forward, that there is a shift in the spirit, that they've made some decisions in the spirit to love you and to make a decision to walk in your ways and serve you for the rest of their lives because of the time we're living in and the people that we need to reach. So I pray, Father, that your anointing and your spirit would just uh, work in them. And I believe that your spirit's already been working in them. But I'm, I'm believing that you continue to work in them, make the changes, that need, cut those, prune those things that need to be pruned out of our lives so that we can keep our eyes on you and focus on the great things you have planned for us to do so we could reach more people for your glory and be a blessing to those around us and live fruitful lives for your glory. And so, Father, I pray for your keeping power for everyone that's hearing this and watching this. Keep them, keep them, and prepare them during these end times for the great things you have planned for them in the name of Jesus. Now, if you're watching or if you're here too and you've not received Jesus, I want to lead you in a simple prayer to receive the Lord. That's where it starts, your new life. Just come and drink. I want you to say, let's say this together. Heavenly Father, oh, I come. I've heard. Yes, I agree that I have sinned against heaven, against you, Lord. I come as a sinner, but I've made a choice to believe your word. I believe that Jesus did die on the cross for all my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again, alive from the dead, to give me new life. Jesus, I come to drink. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Save me now. Make me a new creation. Change me from the inside out. And I decide this day, from this day forward, to live for you by your grace. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new creation in you. I love you and appreciate you. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God.